Great. Good evening. Thank you very much indeed for coming. I'm Bronwyn Maddox. I'm Director of the Institute for Government. And I'm delighted to be here for, this, for the launch of the, the world's biggest quango, five, the first five years of NHS England. We are uh, much looking forward to this discussion. We've got obviously the author, Nick Timmins, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, Jeremy Hunt, and Chris Hamm, Chief Executive of the King's Fund, which has worked with us on this. And he and I uh, worked together on the forward of that. And many of you will know him extremely well. Can I just point out, for those of you who are camera shy, not only is this being live streamed, uh, but there are television cameras here. I'm obliged uh, legally to point this out, and if you don't want to be photographed, you need to go right to the back of the room. Thank you. <laughs> with that, with that with welcoming, warm words, let me uh, ask Nick to kick off in uh, saying what he wants to say about this report. And then Jeremy Hunt will speak, and then Chris, and then we'll have some questions among ourselves, and then there will be lots of questions from you. Nick. Right, great. Well, well. Thank you all very much for being here. And uh, you know, the fact is that most of you won't remotely have had the chance to read this overlong document. But given that it is littered with song titles and lyrics, I was tempted to start with this in memory of Andrew Lansley's act. Extra, extra, read all about it, the pinball wizard in the miracle cure. <laughs> but I won't. So where do I begin? Well, not easy is the answer, because while on the face of it, this is a five-year story, what happened after the creation of NHS England, the world's biggest quango, is also a 25-year story and indeed a 70-year one. The 25-year one is that the nature of NHS England as a statutorily independent commissioning board goes all the way back to 1991 and the introduction of the purchase of provider split as a new way of managing the NHS. In other words, it was to be a commissioning board, not a management one. And the 70-year story is that from its very inception, there were voices wishing that somehow the NHS could be depoliticised, run distinctly more at arm's length from ministers, so that the staff could get on with delivering their very best for patients without political interference. Now, of course, in its purest form, that's always been an opium-driven pipe dream, for reasons I would happily go into in questions. So where do I begin? Well, the answer is with my favourite quote from Never Again, which is the early account of how Andrews Act became law, a quote so good that I used it thrice. It's from Simon Burns, the hapless Minister of State for Health, who had to guide Lansley's immensely complex legislation through the Commons. Challenged over what it was there to do, he said, you cannot encapsulate in one or two sentences the main thrust of this. And that kind of said it in one. It was and is all immensely complex. To the point where, for the first time since 1948, it is impossible to draw an organogram which tells you, with any truth, how the NHS is meant to work. The old organograms, depicting assorted tiers of assorted versions of assorted health authorities whose names ever changed, never told the whole truth, but they told a truth. And these days, that's impossible. But all that said, what did Andrew Zach set out to do? Well, my interpretation is try to do three things. In the words of his white paper, the NHS was to cease to be run through a system of national and regional management. Instead, it was to be subject to, and I quote, a system of control based on quality and economic regulation, commissioning, and payment by results. In other words, the quasi-market approach to running the NHS. The key difference this time around was this quasi-market was to become not just one part of a way of running the service, as it had been for 20 years under both Conservatives and Labour, but the way of running it. No ifs, no buts, no management, and certainly none of the routine performance management that Labour used alongside its quasi-market <coughs> measures. It was to be run solely by a bunch of commissioners and regulators with the myriad organisations that supply NHS services expected to respond to the incentives and the penalties all that involved. The quasi-market was to rule, so to speak. And second, as a consequence of that, and with the creation of independent board, the reform would end, and again, I quote the white paper, political interference in the way it was run. It would put a stop to political micromanagement and to excessive bureaucratic and political control. And the third, the, the third part of the act was it would, in Lance's words, be permanent. By embedding all this in primary legislation, it would be impossible for a health secretary to change it, as it had been relatively easy to do in the past, without recourse to primary legislation. But defined that way, taking it on its own terms, the Act has clearly failed. It clearly has proved permanent, in the sense that it's not been changed. But in the words of one interviewee, well, it hasn't been changed, it's simply been ignored. By which it means that it's been endlessly and repeatedly worked around. 
So two of the bodies that the Act created, an enhanced monitor and the Trust Development Authority, have been merged into something called NHS Improvement. Uh, only technically they have not been merged because the Act prevents that. Instead, the two original organisations simply have the same board, the same chair and the same chief executive while publishing separate accounts and employing their staff on separate terms and conditions, the legacy ones. Even more extraordinary, it's become increasingly clear that NHS Improvement and NHS England, which is technically only the commissioning board, are also slowly but surely being merged. The Act makes a formal merger impossible. But the two had their first joint board meeting today, Although the law is such that the cross-representation on the board has had to be two people with a possibly unique designation of being, and again I quote, associate bracket non-voting bracket non-executive directors. A piece of 1984 news speak of which even George Orwell might have been proud. And much more locally, of course, the Sustainability and Transformation Partnerships are trying to do what it says on that tin, but without having any of their own statutory powers. Furthermore, while seeking to embed the quasi-market in detailed legislation, the Act has in fact proved to be a victory in yesterday's war. Not just in the, NH in the NHS, it has proved to be the high watermark of faith in choice and competition as the way of improving public services. Since then, the direction of travel has been in a rather different direction, towards more integration and cooperation, with something that is starting to look rather like a management board at its head. Andrew's white paper used the word choice 70 times almost all in the context of, provide, of choice providing competition and therefore improve services. The five-year forward view uses it just half a dozen times and only once in terms that might be interpreted as using choice as an economic <coughs> driver of improvement. Now there has, it is true, been a relatively small increase in percentage point terms in the proportion of NHS services delivered privately, chiefly in the community, but services are being taken back in-house as well as tendered out. And finally, if the aim of the Act was to somehow depoliticise the service, ending political micromanagement, well, that has not prevented the Secretary of State being as intimately involved as many of his predecessors in key elements of the service, poring over lengthening waiting times, poring over winter pressure, plannings and pressure, pre pressure planning and demanding action, as well as promoting the quality and safety agenda that has been a hallmark of Jeremy Hunt's time as Secretary of State. But I would argue there have in fact been successes, just not necessarily in the form that the Act's originators intended. It clearly has, with Simon Stevens as the Chief Executive of NHS England, given the NHS its own independent voice. Too independent at times, in the eyes of some in Number 10 and the Treasury, where the complaint has been heard that they are meant to be independent, but not that bloody independent. No previous NHS Chief Executive could have published the five-year forward view, or made so transparently, publicly, repeatedly and vigorously the case around the money for both health and social care. Nor, backed by his board, could a previous NHS executive have been so clear that for this much money, this is what we can do. And on the broader SDP plans, there have been moments when it's felt there's been almost a kind of role reversal to the one under the Act intended. Simon Stevens acting more as Secretary of State, with Jeremy as the Chief Operating Officer, dealing with particular aspects of NHS performance. That, however, may well only have been possible because the Secretary of State has chosen to act that way and be willing to. Personalities matter in this story. In a few weeks' time, Jeremy will become the longest serving Health Secretary in the history of the NHS, and I would argue there has been merit in that. It has allowed a degree of consistency that rarely happens when you get endlessly rotating Health Secretaries, even when they are all part of the same administration. And indeed, there is a case that if Jeremy had not acted the way he has, insisting on bringing together on a weekly basis the many balkanised, if nominally statutorily independent, arms length bodies that the Act created, if that hadn't happened, and it may well, as he has, it may well have been, as he has put it, that the Act would have fallen flat on its face, rather than operated in a different way to the one Andrew intended. And Jeremy Hunt and Simon Stevens have always been aligned over the direction of travel, better integrated care, but they're now clearly aligned over the money. And if a proper long-term settlement for the NHS and social care does indeed emerge, as a result of Theresa May's recent, relatively recent appearance before the Liaison Committee, then both will go down in history, and in a good way. But the way the Act has been, or has had to be, worked around does raise questions for the future. Today is not just the first joint board meeting of NHS Improvement and NHS England, at which, incidentally, steps to have a single finance director and a single chief nurse were announced, but there's also been a court hearing 
in which the plans to get more integrated providers are being subjected to judicial review. Now, one can't know the outcome of that. But the way in which the actions under the Act are being legally challenged, and may again be, and the nature of the workarounds does point at some point to the likelihood of fresh legislation. And that should probably worry those who, like me, believe that organisation, reorganisation and re-disorganisation has long been the English NHS disease. But it may at some point be inevitable. But, and while lots of people coming at it from lots of different places, some of them ideological, would seem to want lots of bits of the law changed, I suspect they remain a long way from agreeing on which bits and in which way. But then perhaps that too is part of Andrew's legacy. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Nick. And um, I, I remember when, um, fairly soon after I became Health Secretary, David Nicholson took me aside and said, if it were a country, the NHS would have the 33rd largest GDP in the world. Um, and that made me feel good for about one nanosecond. Um, and I sometimes reflect, has it ever, ever felt like being head of state? Um, and the answer is categorically never. Um, and uh, I do remember um, when Michael Fallon was in the cabinet, he once said to me, the difference between your job and my job is that everywhere I go, people salute me. And um, I thought, yeah, that is a big difference. Um, but um, I want to uh, thank Nick for uh, an absolutely fascinating um, and very important piece of work, which I hope will become much, much more than just uh, a historical account of what's happened. Uh, because what Nick does better than anyone else is uh, address one of the big weaknesses that we have in our political system, which is uh, a lack of institutional memory and therefore a lack of ability to learn uh, the lessons of history as applied to um, our current uh, decisions and, and political challenges that we face. I need to just start off by apologising to Paul and Laura and one or two other of the uh, journalists present that I'm not going to be able to say very much, if anything, about the big funding questions that we're facing. Um, not that you were wanting to ask me about those, I'm sure. Um, but very simply because uh, a running commentary on those discussions, which are live, uh, will not enable me to do what I need to do, which is to get the best possible deal for the NHS and that long-term uh, financial settlement that we all know will be the best thing for the NHS and social care system. I know it won't stop you asking, but I just wanted to um, set expectations. Um, going back to the... This, this issue of the, the failure we have in government of uh, learning the lessons of history. Um, I always remember um, some of the very early meetings I had in the Department of Health when we were wrestling with how to respond to mid-staffs. I think the, probably the most significant legislative change that I will be associated will, with will be the setting up of the CQC in its current format. And it's great to see David Pryor here, who's had such a, an incredibly important role in those early days and, and having a legally independent chief inspector of hospitals. Um, but when I think of the discussions that we had, um, I used to have these discussions on a weekly basis as to what the best response was. And I wanted to have Ofsted ratings for hospitals and GP surgeries and care homes and so on. And um, that was uh, for a number of reasons, but because I've been inspired by conversations that I had with Paul Corrigan and many others about the power of the education reforms. Um, but I sensed after endless discussions with civil servants that we weren't really getting anywhere and that there was a kind of lack of enthusiasm. And then finally, after months of these meetings, um, in frustration, I said, look, I really th I've got this feeling that no one thinks this is a good idea. Could someone tell me why? And it took my permanent secretary to have the courage to say to me, well, we don't think it's a good idea because it didn't work before. And I thought, well, why didn't you say so? You know, let's, and then we had a very good discussion about why the star rating system, 
that was introduced by the previous Labour government for hospitals actually hadn't worked terribly well and ended up being scrapped. And that was incredibly important in setting up the new CQC system in a way that avoided those mistakes. And the, you know, the argument was made to me that the reason that that system hadn't worked is because it was too closely associated with ministerial targets and was seen as a performance management tool. If you did what the NHS leadership and ministers wanted, you got your three stars as a hospital. Um, and it wasn't a holistic view that could be shared by the public and the NHS as to the overall uh, quality of uh, a performances organisation. So um, I think the really important lesson from this is that the civil service that is uh, meant to be our corporate memory has to have people who have the confidence to challenge ministers uh, in a very open way um, about what's being proposed so that you can have a really good discussion and get ideas right. With respect to the Act, um, I think there are some positive things uh, which Nick uh, mentions, which I think it is worth giving credit to Andrew Lansley for. I do think it has been a big step forward to have an independent NHS England. Uh, I think that has been positive in all sorts of ways, but probably the most significant is that um, contrary to what a lot of people might read in the HSJ, um, my involvement and the Secretary of State's involvement in operational decisions is much, much less than it was. I do have the right and exercise the right to involve myself in a narrow range of issues that I think are very important to Parliament and the public. So the performance of a &E's in the run-up to winter is not something that any Secretary of State would ever be able to say, that's nothing to do with me. But the, uh, the system, as I understand it, that we used to have where health ministers would brush around the country uh, making numerous small announcements about an initiative here or an initiative there has largely gone. Ministers tend just to make big announcements about policy changes, but not, not those small announcements. And I think that has been positive. And I always found that very easy to live with because I came from the Department of Culture, Media and Sport, where uh, the independence of the Arts Council was established. And I thought it was a very positive thing um, because I didn't think it was a good idea for ministers to be deciding what grants every arts organisation in the country got. And so I was very comfortable with that and I think it's been a success. I also think that the clinical leadership of commissioning has been something that was much asked for in the run-up to the Act and I think has broadly been a success. Um, and I think the, um, although it hasn't stopped it being talked about, as we saw this week in Parliament, the very hackneyed debates about the privatisation of the NHS, um, which, which isn't happening, have really been dealt with by the fact that the decisions about whether the public sector or the private sector are used in any individual situation are just not taken by politicians. They are taken by CCGs who are led by clinical commissioners. Um, and I think that has uh, depoliticised one of the most potentially toxic parts of the debate on the NHS and I think that was positive because although I'm in favour of ministers doing things I think in the case of the NHS uh, if a Conservative government favoured the private sector or a Labour government favoured the state sector uh, then that is always interpreted by voters as being done for ideological reasons and, um, and that is not healthy in, uh, in the context of um, health policy making. Um, I think where um, Andrew would disagree with uh, much of the analysis uh, of his act would be over the move to integrated care, which he would maintain is entirely possible under his act. I think many people on the NHS front line would disagree with that. Um, but what I would just say in conclusion about Andrew is that I have never met a politician who is more committed to the NHS and whatever disagreements people had with his policies on a personal level, you just had to talk to him for a short period of time. This was someone who's absolutely passionate about the NHS 
and I hope that he will be remembered for other things as well as the act, such as, for example, some very good work that he did on cancer policy, which is obviously uh, very topical given that he himself has very sadly got cancer, uh, which he's now recovering from. And um, finally, um, I just think it's uh, interesting for me, in the context of that act, to ask myself what are the things that I wish I'd known five and a half years ago that um, I think I know now uh, that would have really helped me do my job better. And they're all areas that uh, the Act touches on. Um, and I think the first one would be the importance of workforce planning in everything you do. Now, the, the Act uh, set up uh, Health Education England and the LETBs and made some quite big structural changes, but uh, that doesn't deal with the necessity of actually going through a process of calculating exactly how many doctors, exactly how many nurses, exactly how many um, AHPs you're going to need for any new policy you do. And, and I think about the, um, the, the Francis report, we knew we needed more nurses in our wards, very apparent when you read that report that, that short staffing was happening. We put in place lots of policies to, to require trusts to employ extra nurses, the new CQC regime, the um, uh, ward uh, nurse transparency publication data, many other things. But we never in our response to the Francis report, if you go back, actually asked ourselves where the extra nurses were going to come from. In fact, we do have 15,000 more nurses in total in the NHS than we had then, so we have been able to find uh, extra nurses. But the truth is that is not a limitless supply. And as we look forward, it's clear to me that we need to have much more structured, detailed, thoughtful workforce planning. So what you see in the NHS today, for example, on mental health, we know that to deliver the mental health forward, you will need 19,000 more posts. To deliver the children's mental health green paper, we will need another 8,000 posts and that sort of detailed workforce planning is absolutely essential. Uh, second thing uh, that I think would have been helpful for me to know but I've come to understand much better is the interdependence of the NHS with other sectors like social care, like uh, public health, like housing um, and you know the, the great challenge that we are going to have to face up to in the next uh, 10, 20 years is much smarter ways of supporting frail patients to stay healthy and happy at home for longer. And the NHS can't do that on its own. And we are linked to the social care sector completely umbilically. Uh, and that's why I do think it's essential that as we talk about a, a long-term plan for the NHS, we also put together a long-term plan for the social care sector um, but it isn't just social care, it's, it's many, many other sectors if we're going to crack prevention. Um, and then the final thing which um, I think I have come to understand much better is the importance of culture. Um, when we were responding to the Francis report, we knew that the NHS needed to become more patient focused. The Act had some measures in place. I think that's why Health Watch was set, off, set up. Um, I um, pursued that further with the, the new role for the CQC. But it has become very clear to me that real change in any large organisation actually happens not when you put in place plans to get to change a specific outcome from X to Y, but actually when you change the way people approach all the decisions they take. And I think the biggest problem in modern medicine, not just in this country, but across the world, is our failure to be better at spreading best practice. We know in the NHS there's huge variations in the quality of care across different countries. The new CQC regime is helping us to understand that. But it's not just understanding it exists, it's knowing what you do to address it. And for me, at the heart of this is to have a learning culture across the NHS uh, where we do truly become the world's largest learning organisation. And I would just say that that is not something that you can do uh, by legislation, by performance management, uh, 
uh, it can only done, be done by consent and it can only be done uh, with uh, a real passion and commitment that comes from all 1.4 million NHS employees. So um, thank you, uh, Nick, for a fantastic piece of work um, which has got us all thinking um, and I sincerely hope I'm not here in five years' time when you do the next one. <laughs> Jeremy Hunt, thank you very much indeed. Chris? So I'll be brief. Um, I want to go to the conclusions that Nick draws based on the story, and I'll come back to the story briefly at the end. There are two explanations that Nick advances, as you'll see when you read his monograph, for why the Act did not deliver what Andrew Lansley uh, intended, two among many. One is that behaviour trumps legislation, and the other is that personalities matter. And I agree with both of those, but I'd like to add another uh, way of thinking about the issues, which is that institutions trump personalities. And what I mean by that is if you go into the story that comes through very clearly from these pages, what's clear is that the health secretary of the day is working within a constrained institutional environment, partly within Whitehall um, and the relationship between the department on the one hand, treasury and number 10 on the other. The health secretary can never be entirely the master of her or his destiny. Secondly, the continuing influence of Parliament and parliamentary accountability. And thirdly, of course, and colleagues from the media are here today, the very intense and constant media scrutiny of what's happening within the NHS. And all of those factors conspire to produce what Nick conveys in this wonderful monograph of a health secretary that remains closely involved and very powerful, not least around the operational issues, and whose own behaviour is shaped by that institutional environment and the complexities that it brings to bear on what happens in the department. The second uh, observation I wanted to offer is that if we think about relationships between national bodies and their leaders, we would be wrong to see them as a zero-sum game. What is very clear is that the creation of NHS England has created a much more independent force in that particular national body, partly because of some of the personalities who are leading NHS England, but at the same time, we have a Secretary of State who's been closely involved and uh, a real influence in his own right on patient safety and quality and the issues around the operational management of the NHS. <coughs> it's not as if one has replaced the other, they are both key players in the multi-headed beast that is the NHS and the national bodies that play a part today. Where perhaps there has been a shift is a very different role for the department itself. And I speak as an ex-civil servant who spent uh, four and a half years in the Department of Health as it was in those days in the noughties. And clearly a lot of the uh, functions of the department around policy development and strategy have been ceded to NHS England in particular. And it raises a question for me as to, so what exactly is the core and distinctive role of the Department of Health and Social Care today in the light of the growing independence and influence of uh, NHS England. My third final observation is a much broader one which goes back to the intention in the legislation to create permanent change, perhaps permanent revolution, although I don't think that phrase was actually used at that time, and embedding and enshrining the uh, Lansley changes in the Gargantuan Health and Social Care Act 2012. I think anybody reading Nick's story would say one thing we desperately need is uh, more humility and less hubris on the part of our politicians in thinking about how they can play their part in reforming and hopefully improving the uh, NHS. 
Uh, the approach in 2012 and leading up to that clearly fell into the latter category with the consequences that Nick described in Never Again, because of course this is the sequel to uh, Never Again. And I think there's a very powerful message that we can all take from the, uh, the story that unfolds in those pages. And of course, it can't be permanent. We've already alluded this afternoon to the changes now taking place between NHS England, NHS Improvement, the all but merging of those two organisations, which is not at all the intention, but is the logical consequence of the learning that's happened over the last five years. And can I, Bronwyn, finally, perhaps on behalf of both of us, add to what's already been said? I think we all owe a debt of gratitude uh, to Nick, and I think uh, we're both proud as organisations to have commissioned him to do the work. It is a riveting read. Uh, not just for nerdy people like me and some of you in the room looking around at particular individuals. Uh, but, you know, this is good uh, bank holiday reading weekend. If it happens to rain, uh, sit down in your front room and go through these pages. You will not be disappointed. So, Nick, thank you. Um, uh, Chris, thank you very much indeed for that. I know it's, it's, yeah. Uh, it's not supposed to rain, but nonetheless, um, Nick's narrative pace and the sweep of history in this uh, really takes you through it. Nick, let me, let me ask you though, one point ex explicitly, because you've said that the Act failed in the terms that it set out, uh, or judged by the things it set out to achieve, and that there's been all kinds of work around since. Um, at the same time, the problems that it set out to achieve, uh, to, to solve, have been ones that, in some respects, we've been able to see coming for a long time, if you just take the, uh, the ageing society and so on. Do you think the Act took us forward in solving those things? No, I think if anything, it took us, mm. to, went backwards. Um, because I think, mm. I mean, it consumed a phenomenal amount of political capital and political energy. I mean, if you, mm. you, know, if you go back to before the Act, David Cameron set out to detoxify the NHS and this equal conservatives and has succeeded. I mean, there was a moment when he was more trusted with the NHS than either Gordon Brown or Tony Blair. And the last time that happened with the Conservative was donkeys years ago. You know? so, and, and it was clear, it was already transparently clear because we'd had white papers and green papers and what, that, that the need was to drive towards more integrated care. And all of that just sort of got put onto one side while the huge political capital was consumed and energy and time in getting this act through. So I think it sort of went backwards rather than went forwards. Thank you for that directness of that. Now, Jeremy Hunt, where do we, where do we go from here? Do you need more legislation to do what you want, particularly in terms of integration? Well, I have noticed quite a big change in mood on this. I mean, when I arrived, you know, the, the thing that everyone said is, please, no more legislation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it was like, you know, we had, you know, every... Uh, Occasion, the run-up to the 2015 election, it was sort of no more top-down reorganisations was sort of uh, both the mantra to us and the mantra from us because, uh, you know, we would not have won that election if people had thought there was any uh, risk of any kind of big new piece of legislation. And, and uh, I remember, you know, every sort of minor, any tiny hint of legislation, you know, Andy Bernard would jump in and say, there you go, Tories planning a top-down reorganisation. And so... Now I think we're in a very different space and I think people are much more pragmatic and you know, I, I, one thing I would give great credit to Simon Stevens on is that I think he has uh, created a great unity of purpose around the five year forward view and I think that there are people who are now saying well in order to deliver you know, integrated joined up care um, that focuses on prevention rather than cure, um, do we need to look at current legislative structures? I mean. You know, if, if uh, I could have changed one tiny detail in that 2012 Act, but only one, I would have made CCGs co-terminus with local authorities, because I think that would have uh, mm. made the joining up of health and social care easier. But um, there are questions like that. Um, obviously, we have a parliament that doesn't have a majority, and so the practicality of getting legislation through the House of Commons is very challenging, um, but not necessarily impossible if there was a political consensus around it. And um, on the other hand, I would say that it may be an advantage that just for the next couple of years, as we build up steam around new models of care, uh, we can really think through what the legislative structures and the lines of accountability are that we really need. And we can get a consensus 
in the NHS and the consensus among the public and we can avoid what I think Chris was talking about there, which is sort of, you know, a small uh, group of people taking a white sheet of paper and saying, now, if I was going to design the NHS from scratch, how would I do it, which, um, you know, can lead to problems. Chris, we need more legislation. At some point we do, um, but not top-down yeah. mega reorganisation, as Jeremy has just said. Uh, to take forward the ambitions and very welcome ambitions to try and integrate health and social care, bring population public health much more in the picture. Progress is being made. Um, we've been working with the integrated care systems across England and it's uh, tangible and evident that despite the system, People are finding a way of giving more emphasis to older people with frailty, to children and others who would benefit from integrated care, but they're bumping up against the limits. So at the right time, we will need legislation to make it easier to do the right thing. Uh, David Bean, who's with us tonight, has talked about the powers of CQCs. CQC may need to be changed around the emphasis on system working. We will need to legislate to enable NHS E and I to be fully merged, going beyond what was mm. announced today. If the ACOs are going to go ahead, they need to be placed within a legal context. And the work that's happening within the integrated systems and the STPs, they depend at the moment very much on goodwill and a commitment through local government and the NHS to work together. They can't make decisions. There needs to be a way of enabling those structures at some point to have more decision-making responsibility to accelerate some of that progress. But mm. now is not the time. Mm. How much, um, Secretary of State, how much of a, an answer is uh, changing the structure uh, when you have the question of money hanging over it all? We had the IFS and Health Foundation saying uh, this morning what others have said, uh, lots more money needed. Well, I think, uh, you know, you've got to have adequate resourcing, you've got to have the right structures, and you've got to have leadership. And you need all of those three things. If any one of those three things are missing, uh, then you will uh, struggle to take things forward. Mm. Nick, do you want to say something quickly about the, the, uh, the money question? Uh, well, the money question is the money question, isn't it? I mean, we, 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 we await with bated breath to see what emerges as a long-term settlement. But, um, I mean, the legislation question is, I think, actually quite complicated because it's not just about whether you turn NHS I and NHSE into one organisation. It's, you know, the, there's the other bit of NHS improvement, which is the market regul regulator bit. Yeah. And, you know, what do you do with that? And that goes at, you know, that's actually quite a fundamental question because it comes back to how far you think there should be a statutory framework around market and competition for the NHS or not. Um, and there will be vigorous debate about that across parties, because I mean, Labour's view would be they want to get, you know, they want to bring all the services back in-house. Mm. So for a minority government, you, you, you couldn't just do that, the merging of the board bit without addressing that question, and that would be politically controversial. Mm. And do you agree parties. with what Jeremy Hunt has said, that in, in a sense some of the heat, the political heat has gone out of that, that there is an acceptance of... Um, you know, uh, the, the, the role of the market isn't being decided by, um, you know, by politicians at this point. Well, the individual contracting out decisions mm. aren't being taken by no. politicians, but there is a statutory framework in place that's mm. actually, you know, m m the NHS improvement retains the duty of being a, 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 a anti you know, to prevent anti-competitive behaviour. Yeah. So there is a framework out there that is there. And uh, I think there's a, well, you yourself have said that we're actually too much stuff's going out to tender because the lawyers are all over it and it would be mm. sensible if we could sort of rein that back in. But reining it back in is not the same as getting rid of the whole thing. So, and, you know, that would be a matter of quite vigorous debate, I think. Mm -hmm. Any last points? I'm conscious, it's not that I've, uh, are short of questions, I'm conscious of a wall of them out there, though. Uh, Any I'll, last points I'll on pass, that? Right, let's, let's go to some questions and then <coughs> we come back over there. Could you wait for a microphone, there, please? And indeed, um, say who you are. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Laura Kunzberg from BBC News. And um, Secretary of State, I know you don't want to wade into the enormous giant news story of the day, um, but you've been arguing tonight that you want the government to learn lessons of the past. Are you confident the government will learn the lessons of the past and the one that the NHS needs about 4% every year, year after year, in order to be healthy in the long term? Well, what I've been arguing inside government for the best part of a year is 
that the biggest lesson of the past when it comes to NHS funding is that we don't do feast or famine very well. Um, so we know that um, the last seven years when we've been in the aftermath of the financial crash have been very, very tough, but we also know that the feast years before that, uh, there was a lot of waste, um, a lot of misuse of resources, and actually a lot of disappointment uh, with expectations about transformation not met, although there were some positive things in that period, not least the bringing down of waiting times. So um, my argument is that the NHS needs a, a long-term funding settlement that creates stability. Um, and I'm you know, very encouraged. I think the Prime Minister completely understands this. She's absolutely passionate about the NHS. Um, and she wants the NHS to have a multi-year settlement. And the way I would put it is just that, you know, in 10 years' time, like a train coming down the track, we will have a million more over 75s. And the choice we face as a country is, do we deal with that challenge in an ad hoc way, in a sticking plaster way, or do we actually look at this strategically and say, this is a huge challenge for the country. It's very important for the British people. We want the NHS to be the safest, highest quality healthcare system in the world. We're incredibly proud of what it does. Uh, but we now need the ability to do that long-term planning. And that's what the government recognises. And I'm very confident we'll be able to bring forward proposals to do that. So if I could just add to that. Uh the short answer, Laura, is yes. The NHS does need about 4% a year in real terms. That's the long-term trend increase which has been provided since 1948 and given the pressures are even greater and will increase for the reason that Jeremy's mentioned. There's no reason to believe that that isn't about the right figure now. I thought it was really unhelpful this morning the way the IFS Health Foundation report was reported because when I turned on the news at six o'clock, it was all about taxes going up by £2,000 per household to fund the extra funding rather than the argument about the quantum of money and the rationale for that quantum of money. Taxes will have to go up. It doesn't have to be all household tax. There's a whole range of taxes that in different ways might be able to contribute. Property taxes, business taxes, sales taxes, national insurance, income taxes. It's a really important and quite complex debate. But if you start the discussion by saying £2,000 per household, you're going to frighten the horses before you even start. And I think whoever put that headline out there needs to think twice. Well, let's just explore that for a second because um, they're, they're not horses being frightened. It's, it's people being told what the consequences of this are. Well, and isn't, isn't that part of the job of any... Uh, government at this point looking to put more money in but saying to people look this is what uh, the reality of what it's going to cost yes but not to simplify unnecessarily and unhelpfully what by definition is a quite complex set of arguments you know I know there isn't a lot of time on the headline news first thing in the morning to go into a very nuanced debate but it needs to be a very nuanced debate both with the public and among experts like in the room tonight that's the problem let's, let's go on go on to others um uh, Secretary of State, Paul Kelso, Sky News. I know you don't want to go into the details of your negotiations with the Chancellor, uh, but do you think he gets the case you've just made, and do you think the British public are willing to accept the consequences for their pockets of those big spending decisions? Um, to answer the second question first, I think the British public... Uh, are absolutely passionate about the NHS and the care system, which is, uh, in a way, part of the NHS uh, family, and we certainly think of it that way. And I think poll after poll shows that uh, they do recognise that uh, through the tax system we will end up having to contribute more, and there is a willingness to do that, providing they can see the money going to the NHS and providing they can see that it's not being wasted. Um, I think from the Chancellor's point of view, he well understands that. Uh, he has a responsibility to make sure that the funding for all public services is within what the country can afford. Um, and of course, that's important because the NHS depends on a strong economy more than other health systems because the vast majority of our funding comes directly from tax coffers. Um, but I think the thing that's important for the Chancellor and the Treasury is that a long-term plan 
allows you to get productivity savings that means that you get better bang for your buck. So if I give you an example, uh, most hospitals would say that a good IT system uh, takes four to five years before you get any payback. If you only give the hospitals their budget for one year in advance, uh, how are they going to be able to properly invest in IT systems that can, for example, free up a quarter of a nurse's time? And so it's those kind of productivity changes that we miss the opportunity to benefit from if we don't have a long-term plan. Uh, what about the funding? I mean, in the long run, it's of course affordable. I mean, because you know, so long as, so long as we have a country where there's still economic growth, then we can afford to spend more on healthcare. I mean, if you, I mean, if you go back to the 1960s, uh, we were spending about four percent of GDP on healthcare, and there are projections that it would be eight or ten by 2010. And believe it or not, that happened. But it's, it's something where you're taking a larger slice out of a much larger cake, so there's plenty of money left for other things. So, of course, there is room to do that over time. But it may be at the expense of other things. In fact, uh, well, no, it's, I, I, I can draw it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice little, it's still a little chart. It's, that, you know, it's a little thing like that. That's the size of the economy. The economy has grown that much. You're taking a bigger slice. There's a hell of a lot more money left over there than there was there. Nick, I have a feeling, <laughs> any, any answer to this? <laughs> Is going to be more complicated. That's right, isn't it? That's right, isn't it, Vicky? Thank you. Absolutely amazing. Thank you. Economist says that is right. On a platform about why this has been so difficult to solve, uh, it is obviously more expensive. But let's. Um, um, sorry, there were quite a lot of hands at the back, and then I'm moving forwards. Uh, all right, let me come over to the side, and then I'll come, I'll come, I'll come to you. Over here. Yep. Andy Cowper from Health Service Journal and Health Policy Insight. Um, Nick's book talks about the Lansley intention to make the reforms uh, irreversible, which kind of reminds me of making the Titanic unsinkable. So what does the panel think about the uh, unsinkability of the NHS Commissioning Board, which is the real name for NHS England? Um, and the panel have all made references actually to NHS improvement uh, and its announcement today of a number of board papers which are talking about repositioning its functions very much more as an NHS provision board, leaning quite hard on providers and systems. What does the panel think would be the consequences of that? Thanks, Chris. So I think, um, Andy, I mean, you and I have talked about these things uh, before. One of the problems we've had with the Act is the lack of an overall view of what's happening across commissioners and providers and the other parts of the NHS because of the separation particularly between NHS England and NHS Improvement. And I have to say, if I'd have been Health Secretary, God forbid, during this period, I'd have been pulling my hair out even more in not knowing who to talk to, to really understand where do the deficits sit, what does performance look like, because that was one of the pieces of collateral damage, that lack of a single version of the truth, a single person to talk to who would be able to bring all of that together. That's not a comment on the quality of the people in the different leadership roles. Again, it's an issue, issue about the institutional architecture. So for me, what I think is intended with today's announcement is to recreate that as best is possible within the constraints of the legislation and enabling NHSE and I to work as one with much more in the way of joint posts, joint board meetings to enable the Secretary of State and others to be able to understand really what's going on and to avoid, if you like, the risk of buck passing between different parts of the system. As that happens, you do need to have some capability at the centre around provider development and provider reconfiguration. You can argue where that best sits and you can also argue as to whether NHS improvement, given the work it's been doing so far, actually has that capability or will have to grow it because the world in future will be different. Thanks, Jeremy Hunt. Um, I think <coughs> there's a short-term and a longer-term consequence of the kinds of changes that were announced today and the general direction of travel. Um, the short-term issue that we face is that, in my view, running a hospital is one of the most difficult jobs in Britain today. Um, you've got not just to deal with between six and 20,000 staff, but you've got to balance books, deal with the media, 
Um, if, if you get things wrong, people die. It's an incredibly complex and challenging job. Uh, and we make it even more challenging because they feel they have to report to multiple masters. So, you know, NHS Improvement, NHS England, the CCGs, the CQC, um, there's possibly the STP, there's a huge range of different people they have to deal with. And, and there are, you know, there have been times where people get opposite signals from the two biggest fish in that pond, which are NHS Improvement and NHS England, which is clearly not sensible. So um, this will help to address that, and I think it will help uh, hospital chief executives to make faster progress on the most important thing they can do of all, which is to help uh, move their hospitals up the quality ladder and help us have more good and outstanding hospitals. Um, but I think the, the longer term issue, as we all talk about moving to integrated care and population health models, uh, it is actually important to go even further back in learning the lessons of history. Uh, and there's a, you know, quite a consensus across the political spectrum and inside the NHS that the internal market has gone too far and there's too much contracting out. We said so in our manifesto the last election. Um, and are open to reforms to deal with that. But we should also remember why Ken Clark set up the internal market, which is to stop local cosy monopolies uh, that were operating in the provider interest and not in the patient interest. So it's very important that the new structures that we set up or allow to be set up don't go back to that monopolistic behaviour. And I think we have learned there are other ways that you can hold organisations responsible and probably the most important thing is transparency about the outcomes that they're delivering for patients, um, but there are other ways as well. Thanks. You put those yeah. points about the internal market with, well. I agree with all of that because mm. you, know, you have to remember the purchase of rights split was originally brought in as a way of tackling exactly what Jeremy just described, and as it's heading back towards a more managed system, you have to ask the question: so how is it going to be held to account? And can I just add a very small point? There's a huge amount of cost contained within the complex arrangements we're talking about here. I don't know if anybody's put a precise figure on, but it runs into the billions of pounds. Having the separate national bodies, then the regional structures, and particularly... The extra the, cost of these structures. Yeah, yeah. And the complexities, too, of the commissioner provider annual contracting round, the nitpicking that goes on between mm -hmm. CCGs mm -hmm. and trusts, and that adds no value at all. You know, to the sum of human happiness and the health outcomes we're all seeking to achieve. So if today's announcement is at least the starting gun for looking at those issues, if we could release a billion pounds from the transaction costs involved in these arrangements and put that into patient care, wouldn't that be a good thing? Excellent. Let's that here in the front, and then I'm coming back to the back. Um, hello Jeremy, my name's Dan Glass. I'm an activist with um, AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power and NHS Campaigns. Um, I've been trying to actually get hold of you for weeks because we're making a documentary on the anniversary, for the anniversary, this the is, 70th anniversary. The opportunity for that. <laughs> no, I'm asking about your comment about that the privatisation of the NHS isn't happening. Um, in fact, we've been speaking to hundreds of nurses, doctors and the general public who say the exact opposite and actually the dismantling and the privatisation of the NHS is down to the government and in particular to you. Um, there's no trees to hide behind now. Uh, what do you say to that? Well, just look at the facts. Um, you know, if you look at the proportion of uh, NHS spending that's being contracted out to the private sector, uh, last year it didn't grow at all. It went up by 0% and uh, the consequence of the 2012 Act is that actually ministers have no influence on what is happening to the proportion of spend being used with the private sector um, anyway. But uh, if uh, our objective had been, I don't think, by the way, outsourcing is the same as privatisation, although I think often people who um, are trying to whip up scare stories collate the two. I think they are actually very different. But if the thing that really uh, worries people is outsourcing, then actually the growth in outsourcing has slowed to nothing. And I think that's probably the best evidence. Thanks. Here in the front. Uh, I think this has been a question for you, Jeremy, really. But I mean, do you think that the combination of genomics, digital technology, 
you know, early diagnosis, machine learning, offers a major productivity opportunity over the next, say, over the next 10 years, which would fill some of the gap that we're looking at. Thank you. And would you say, just for the record, who you are? Please? Sorry, it's David Pryor. I'm chairman of UCLH. I think it uh, offers absolutely huge potential, um, but there is a caveat as well. Um, the, the other mistake that we could make now, which we haven't really been talking about when we start thinking about the next 10 years for the NHS, is to um, make a huge effort to solve yesterday's problems tomorrow. And at the moment, the, the things that are preoccupying us are the integration of the health and social care system, the lack of a joined up system, the, uh, the complexity of our contracting system, all these things rightly need to be addressed and solved. But I would wager that in 10 years time, when we're talking about the big changes that have happened in healthcare, we won't be talking about any of those things. We'll be talking about uh, the massive improvements in health that have become possible thanks to technology and science. And um, I remember when I um, set up uh, my publishing company in the early 1990s, and I remember the first, I, mean, I still remember the day that our PCs were linked up and an email system was put in for the first time. And we thought that was just a, an interesting addition to our convenience to be able to send each other emails. But none of us had any idea that this was going to lead to the total revolution in banking, in shopping, in travel, and all the other industries. And that change has been slow to arrive in healthcare, but is now really beginning to happen. However, I'm skeptical that it will necessarily lead to the huge financial savings that we might perhaps be hoping for, because in all those other industries, uh, what's tended to happen is there's been a quality benefit to consumers, but not necessarily a financial saving, um, because uh, many, you know, the banks, for example, spend billions on their IT systems that they might have been spending previously on their branches. And uh, online banking is fantastically more convenient for us. But I'm not sure there's necessarily been a huge financial dividend for anyone as a result of it. So that would be my thought. And so you're not putting a lot of weight on that as an answer to the um, funding problems, if you like. I mean, of all, of all the alternatives, you know, get, getting more productivity, getting the public to be much healthier. Then, or putting more money in? There are definitely productivity savings, but as I say, I think they tend to manifest themselves in uh, improvements to quality. I think the productivity saving that could have a very big impact on cost is the move to prevention. I think that is the Including the area. public health. You know, if we caught, yeah. including public health, of course, yeah. but if, we, were, if right. we caught many more of our cancers at stage one or two, uh, we would save an enormous amount of cost in surgery that was avoided which becomes necessary mm. if you catch a cancer later on. Those kinds of changes, if we looked after older people better in their homes so they didn't need to go to any in the middle mm. of the night, those things, I think, uh, there is uh, what we would call a cashable saving. So I, just, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think we're kind of going back in a way, aren't we, to Derek Wallace and his warning in 2002 about needing to put much more emphasis on the upstream prevention rather than the downstream treatment. And mm. his warning then was if we didn't do so and didn't have that fully engaged scenario where all of us as citizens played our part, the costs of healthcare would become unaffordable. And some people would say, well, that warning has are. been realized. Right at the back. Yep. Um. Thank you, Anna Dixon, Centre for Aging Better, but probably for this discussion, should declare that I was at the King's Fund, obviously commenting on the act as it was going through, and then uh, working in the department with uh, Jeremy uh, shortly after NHS England was uh, created. Um, so um, really great to hear that, uh, you know, the need for a focus on prevention, particularly in light of the demographic changes and critical to the long-term uh, sustainability of the NHS. You've talked a lot about um, you talked about coterminosity between clinical commissioning and local authorities and I think that was one of the things we uh, were proposing at the time with the King's Fund would have been a good amendment to the, uh, to the bill, unfortunately not made um, at the time. But one of the legal changes you've not touched on was the transfer of public health and indeed preventative services like smoking cessation, NHL uh, health check to local government. 
And I just wondered, in terms of the lessons from history, um, whether if there it does need to be a much more significant focus on prevention within the NHS, whether that's one of the changes that perhaps we should be regretting uh, and bring prevention and a focus on population health back into the heart of the new integrated care systems in the NHS. I think on public health, there are what we call public health is loosely uh, two uh, different areas. One of them are the sort of the big uh, national focus on, on you know, obesity and smoking reduction, and, some, and one of them is a much more local focus on addiction services. And they have been under pressure, and I think when I talk to people on the front line, one of the biggest issues at the moment is the fact that they aren't integrated with the rest of what the NHS does. So if you're dealing with someone who's got a drug addiction problem, uh, what the NHS professional dealing with that person would want to be able to do is to coordinate with housing issues, with uh, mental health issues, and join them all together. I don't think that it's fair to point the entirety of that problem at the fact that they're commissioned by local authorities. Uh, because actually things that local authorities could have joined up, such as with housing, haven't really happened either. Um, but I do think as we integrate social care, we've got to be integrating all those services as well going forward. Um, and I think the, um, you know, the other thing I think about population health is that we've, uh, the challenging question we can ask ourselves is not just what are the mistakes of history, but what is the experience of other parts of the United Kingdom? So, you know, in both Scotland and Northern Ireland, they have structures that on the face of it are much friendlier to the integration of care. But both those uh, countries specifically talk about the fact they still have a huge problem of people being stranded in hospitals and uh, resources being sucked into the acute sector, which is ex exactly what we talk about in England. So I think we need to recognise that actually a, a much more um, ambitious approach to population health is going to be needed, uh, which won't just be derived from changes in structures. Can I add to that? I mean, Anna, on your question, I, I spent a day in Wigan not long ago looking at the um, way in which the public health department there in the council is working with the third sector, with the NHS, and it's a fantastic example of the benefits of transferring public health from the NHS to local government because they have a healthy Wigan partnership with a very strong focus on all the things that you and I have talked about many times. But equally there are other parts of the country where that isn't happening i think the big risk has been and the reality cuts in public health spending because public health has been taken out of the more narrowly defined nhs ring fence and that's impacted on hiv aids services to go back to this question among many others so i hope with this long-term funding settlement that we've been promised that will go back to the broader definition and will give proper protection to spending on public health as well as on NHS services. Do you agree with the thrust of what Anna say? It's a, it was a mistake. Well, no, I'm not saying it's a mistake. No, I'm saying that uh, there's take been it out, that right? adverse consequence. Yes. But I wouldn't take it back into the NHS. Fine. Great. Uh, over, over here. Thank you. Uh, Caroline Malloy from Open Democracy. Uh, just following on from the questions about public health, really, and that the, the you acknowledge that the pressure that the services are under in terms of smoking cessation, for example, and weight loss and obesity. Um, do you have any comment on the way in which uh, a quite a significant number of CCGs across the country now are in implementing what have been described by doctors as effectively blanket bans on non-emergency operations for, for example, smokers or people with a uh, body mass index of over 30. E you know, and the Royal College of Surgeons, I know, has been very outspoken about the fact that while that may sometimes be clinically necessary, what CCGs appear to be saying for explicitly cash-saving reasons is a blanket ban on those. And I just wondered if you thought that was acceptable. Well, we are very clear that... Uh all those programs, if they happen for good clinical reasons, then that is a clinical judgment, but they shouldn't be happening for financial reasons. Okay, great. Um, this next one, uh, kind of straight towards the back, thanks. <laughs> 
Um, Rhiannon Sanders from Maitland Consulting. Um, I think it's safe to say that everyone in this room has a much more comprehensive understanding of the NHS than an ordinary person. Um, you know, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a CCG and a trust. Um, how important do you think it is that people have a bit of an understanding about the intricacies of the NHS? So, for example, with STPs and the changes that they were proposing, do you think it's important that people know what those changes mean? Um, or in it, um, so that you can actually boost public confidence in the service? A really interesting question. We shall have the answer. I don't, I don't think they should need to give a damn. <laughs> I mean, you know, why should you be interested in the wiring, for Christ's sake? What you want is the service that works. Uh, so you get people involved with making it work who get very interested in these boundaries and how to make these things function, but I don't think the public should need to know the difference in a CCG and a trust. I mean, it just wants a service. And that's what... It, that's what should be being delivered to it. Um, right, the and, question, and, and, the question and, is partly about does it do anything? Does it do anything of, from a politici politician's point of view to increase public trust? Uh, sorry, does what do anything for politicians? That, that if the public knew uh, more about how the NHS worked, it might do something about public trust. Um, you, and your it, answer it, is it, it sounds like, like the no. public knew how the social care system works, then you discover when they hit it. Yes. That's <laughs> point. better they don't. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> But I mean, I, I just, just sort of going back to what Anna was saying, I mean, this work, getting things worked within, you know, you, you, you take Northern Ireland, which in theory has a much more integrated service and still struggles with the same problems. I think one of the most valuable bits of research anybody could do is discover what it is that is needed so that when something works well in local government or in the NHS, it actually gets taken up more rapidly elsewhere because we're just all public services are bad at it. And I've never quite understood why, but they are. And if anyone could do a bit of research that actually provided an answer to that, that would be immensely valuable. Okay, great. We've got one here on the on the side. In fact, two. Uh, two. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Sarah Pickup from the Local Government Association. Um, Secretary of State, how can we ensure that any new finance that's coming into the health service is invested in community and primary care services and that social care is also addressed in that resourcing picture? Because if we get that infrastructure right, a primary community and social care, that is what will reduce the pressure on the acute hospitals. But time and time again, the funding goes to the wrong place. It goes to the symptom, not the cause. And even more importantly, to the prevention of that, that uh, issue. Thank well, you. I, th I think that's one of the most important things that we need to learn from uh, the challenges in implementing the five-year forward view over the last uh, four years, because uh, what actually happened, as you rightly say, is that pressures in the acute sector um, and the fact that the deficit of acute sector providers ballooned in the early period of the five-year forward view meant that money was sucked out of transformation and community funding. And I think we have learned from that that it is absolutely essential that you find a way uh, with the resources you have to protect transformation funding. Um, so, you know, the best model that I've seen uh, as to where that has actually worked well is the Vanguard's program. It was a very small program, only affecting a very small minority, but you saw um, the chief executive of Frimley Park sitting down with the chief executive of his CCG and saying, okay, how much money do we have to spend in this community and what's the right thing for patients? And they got mm -hmm. Vanguard funding of £5 million a year for three years. Um, and with that money, by the end of three years, they had successfully reduced uh, acute hospital activity by £5 million a year. So they were able to carry on with all that community transformation without the pump priming funding. So that's what we have to get right this time. Two, two seconds. Chris will come in and then, you, then you're absolutely on it. And reinforcing that point, I mean, the bigger example I'm aware of is around Greater Manchester, Sarah, where they did get a slug of the STF money, uh, £450 million over five years to pump prime the work on devolution. And most of that's been spent at a community level in Salford and Bolton and Tameside and so on, which is why partly the vanguards, but also other new care models they put in place beginning to deliver the kind of results we want with an investment, not just in the hospitals, but in those community services and health and social care, as you know, 
working in a very joined up way in places like Tameside, so effectively you're creating a fully integrated commissioning organisation with the Chief Exec of the Council acting as the Accountable Officer for the CCG and also in a couple of other places in Greater Manchester. So if you do the sums and apply that dedicated transformation funding to invest in the services you're talking about, hopefully as part of the funding settlement, about nine billion pounds over five years might be set aside for the rest of the country <coughs> to benefit in the same way that Greater Manchester has already benefited from. Great, over at the side, thanks for your patience. Yeah, yeah Dave needs a uh, lecture at AES London. Um, one, of, one of the things you mentioned about wishing you had learned about culture, and one of the things we know about the NHS is that the culture is not consistent across the piece. Um, you could have somebody, for example, in Lewisham Borough, who has a very positive experience in their NHS, working with a relative, and somebody with a very same situation in Brent might have an absolutely horrible experience. And perhaps that's down to the fact that it's, you know, as we say, the world's largest uh, Quango. But even within large organizations, they manage to establish consistency of experience in the, in the organization. And so, so, I mean, I'm sure everybody in this room will have similar stories of just have this inconsistency in services across, across the board. And I mean, I've done uh, quite a bit of um, consultancy for different firms and organizations and so on. And I've never found um, an, organi an organization where staff are as unhappy and feel undervalued as in the NHS. And part of me wonder if when we set up the NHS, we always thought it was for patients, but it's also for staff and how they feel because they're also users of the NHS. So I wonder if some of this can be factored in the formulation of solutions as we go forward. Thank you very much. Two points really there, consistency and morale. Well, I think, um, you know, to start with the morale point, um, it has been extraordinarily stressful for staff over the last few years and particularly over the last winter and we had the worst winter for very many years uh, and staff bust a gut to keep patients safe and we um, have approximately 45,000 more clinicians, doctors, nurses and other clinically trained people than we had five years ago when I became health secretary but we need more and the truth is that we're only going to get more if we train more and I think the biggest single thing that most staff say would uh, improve their working lives and uh, make them feel valued is if there were more of them to be able to give better care to patients. So that's what we need to urgently address. Um, but in terms of how you tackle variation, I, I completely agree with you. I think it's been, and this is again one of the, you know, from a policy wonk perspective, one of the interesting lessons of history. So the whole direction of travel since the internal market's been set up has been to make NHS organisations more independent on the basis that if we tried to think of it, if we thought of it as one organisation, it would become bureaucratic and cumbersome. So the whole Foundation Trust movement is increasing the independence of um, hospitals. But I think we're now realising that that does create some uh, potentially completely unjustifiable distortions. So on the uh, Getting It Right First Time programme, we know that our most our safest hospitals when it comes to orthopaedic infections, which are a very serious thing if you get one when you're changing a hip or a knee. Our safest hospitals, it's about one in 500 patients. Our least safe hospitals infect about one in 25 patients. And there's somewhere in England where there are two hospitals next door to each other. And one of them is, you know, one in 500 patients, but right next door, same blue NHS sign, it's one in 25 patients. How do you deal with that? I think the answer is, you collect data, you share data, um, and you have people like the CQC who go around asking searching questions to management about what they're doing to address that variation. Mm. And let me squeeze in one last question and the, and the panel use it as their last thoughts as well. Here, please. John Blackburn. Uh, excuse me, could you wait for the microphone? Um, or your points will be lost. Thank you. Jonathan Blackburn Flint. Um, given those variations, do you think it would be a good idea to publish more of that information so that the patients could decide where they wanted to be treated? Um, well, shall I take that first? Because I think it's a very good yeah. question. Yes. Um, and I think many people's instinct would be to say yes. Um, I would, um, though, give a qualified yes. So I would say that 
It's precisely to give patients that information that we set up the new CQC regime, which follows the Ofsted model and gives very, very simple, easy to understand descriptions of uh, the quality of care that you get in an NHS organisation. It can only be one of four things, outstanding, good, requires improvement or inadequate. And therefore, consumers of healthcare in England, I believe, have access to better information about the quality of care they're getting than any other country in the world, because we're the only country so far that has set up that system. With respect to data about individual clinical performance by doctors, uh, you come to a tension, which is that, that the data has to be supplied by doctors and it has to be supplied truthfully by doctors and sometimes it, the data isn't robust and so it has to be done with a process of consent with doctors. Now sometimes uh, they are confident the data is robust and they are happy for it to be published. But what I wouldn't want is to have a situation where the threat of publishing it, that data means that doctors stop cooperating in supplying it and therefore we end up not having any data at all. Let me ask Chris and, and Nick then very very quickly, finally, what data would you like? <laughs> well, I mean, the point, the point is a good one. I think we do have a lot of data. It's about making it usable and comprehensible. Mm -hmm. But I always go back to um, that famous study in New York when they did publish data about variations in outcomes following heart surgery. And what that study showed is when you made the information available to the public, it didn't really change patient behavior, even if there were two or threefold variations. But it did make a positive impact on the behavior of the clinicians and the managers of the hospitals concerned, particularly those that weren't doing so well, who became curious as to why they weren't doing so well. And that led to a raising of standards. So sometimes, as Nick showed in his monograph, there are unintended and beneficial imp yeah, effects of some of these, these changes. And can I make one final point, um, Bronwyn, if I may? I mean, the workforce issue, which Jeremy quite rightly raised right at the beginning, we haven't really picked that up. But you know, we know that one of the big blockers at the moment is the Home Office's approach around visas for staff who've been recruited. Talk to any trust chief executive anywhere in the country at the moment. That is a huge source of frustration for them, and it will continue to hamper our ability to recruit in the short term. I know in the longer term we need to become more self-sufficient. So if I'm allowed to ask a question, it will be of Jeremy. Is there any light at the end of that tunnel? Um, we run out of time so much that it's going to be very yeah. hard to, uh, to answer it. Uh, Nick, a quick quick burst there, or are you? Yeah. No, fine. You're fine. Fine. Right. Well, this has, I'm not going to ruin it by saying it is the, the only event we've had for a very long time that hasn't mentioned, used the B word. Um, uh, but we, we nearly went there with the, we uh, the last one. Okay, we did. We did then. Uh, squeak over that. Um, Nick, <coughs> congratulations on a terrifically readable, uh, typically forthright report that really says what it means, but takes us through the uh, narrative sweep of the history. Chris, uh, thanks for all your insight and thanks to you and your colleagues for supporting it. Jeremy Hunt, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing what emerges later this summer. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.